Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of One Hit Wonderland by Tony Hawks. So this is a non-fiction book. He actually previously wrote Round Island with a Fridge, where he literally went Round Island with a Fridge. I'm going to do what I normally do, which is I'm going to read you the blurb here, and then I'm going to go through and look at some of my tabs, and then at the end I'm going to give you my overall rating and my thoughts. Rewind to 1988. Britain is in the grip of a phenomenon. Radios across the land blast out a new sound. The song is Stutter Rap. The group, Morris Minor and the Majors. The man behind the fake moustache, Tony Hawks. Fast forward to the 21st century and Tony has left those heady music biz days behind. That cherished appearance on top of the pops is but a distant memory. These days music is just a hobby. That is, until it is suggested that Tony is a one-hit wonder, that he will never have a hit again. Ever. Really? Well, we'll see about that. Over the next two years, Tony battles against all the odds to have a hit somewhere, anywhere, in the world. He changes acts and styles with a bewildering lack of integrity. He travels to Nashville, songwriting capital of the universe, to Amsterdam for that elusive Euro anthem, to Eastern Europe to duet with a Romanian beauty, and even to Africa in search of the ultimate melody. In his quest for pop immortality, Tony leaves no stone unturned, but it's only after a chance encounter with Norman Wisdom that things get really strange. Is it really possible that together they could crash the charts in Albania? Amidst all the, uncertain amidst all the uncertainty, only one thing is clear. In One Hit Wonderland, anything is possible. Okay, so first of all, we've got the acknowledgements, which gave me a good chuckle. He says, Much to my surprise, I wasn't able to complete this book without the help of others. So regretfully, it falls upon me to offer thanks to the following. And uh, yeah, because previously some of Tony Hawk's books have revolved around him taking bets, uh, we get this, this is right at the start. Tony, you must get people making bets with you all the time. This was what I kept hearing, and given my recent history of accepting wages, you would certainly expect this to be the case. However, what actually happens most of the time is that people come up to me and say, you must get people making bets with you all the time. For the most part, the bets that have emerged have been entirely influenced by the fact that I once hitchhiked round Ireland with a fridge. Consequently, I have been urged to make journeys to distant parts of the world lugging miscellaneous pieces of furniture or domestic appliances. One potential bet did differ from these others, but it bore too much resemblance to my second wager, in which I'd attempted to beat the entire Moldovian national football team at tennis, one by one. I received the challenge when I made the mistake of allowing myself to share a few drinks in the pub with my friend Arthur. I bet you, Tony, he croaked, while coughing cigarette smoke into the already smoky atmosphere, that you can't sleep with the entire Azerbaijani netball team. As my initial laugh subsided, I was struck by a rather depressing thought. Had I become a strange kind of plaything for other people? Was I the mug who just went off and did whatever was asked of him? And if I was, then what was I trying to prove? Alright, so we have this kind of sobering moment after an episode of Top of the Pops, um, where this happens. I know it sounds a bit naff, but I'm not feeling that great and I've got an early start in the morning. But Phil, it's quarter to nine. I know, but nothing is happening and I haven't got the energy to force it. I feel a bit shitty, actually, added Paul apologetically. I might turn in too. What? Sorry, mate, but this place is depressing. But we could go out somewhere and wallow in the glory. We've just been on top of the pops. Yes, but no one's going to know that, remarked Phil. It doesn't get broadcast till tomorrow night. Yes, yeah, said Paul. And if we go up to girls and tell them that we're going to be on top of the pops tomorrow night, then they're just not going to believe us. So that's it then, is it? I asked in disbelief. The boys nodded sheepishly. It was. So rock and roll. Here he lists some of his favourite country music song titles. So we've got Drop Kick Me Jesus Through the Goalposts of Life. I fell in a pile of you and got love all over me. I don't know whether to kill myself or go bowling. I want to whip your cow. I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. If my nose were full of nickels, I'd blow it all on you. My head hurts, my feet stink and I don't love Jesus. She got the ring and I got the finger. You can't have your Kate and Edith too. You can't roller skate in a buffalo herd. And pardon me, I've got someone to kill. And here he is talking about the Bon Jovi song, Living on a Prayer. I was puzzled by the whole concept of this song. I couldn't understand why he was so excited by the prospect of being halfway there. Surely it would have been better to have waited till he got the whole way there before he started shouting about it. I really felt that the levels of enthusiasm he was exhibiting in his vocal performance were not apposite for someone who had only completed 50% of the journey. At this rate, he'd be a bit puffed by the time he was three quarters of the way there and completely knackered at the point of arrival. I th this, this tickled me too, he said, uh, he's in Nashville here, he says, The listings also showed that you could go line dancing every night of the week if you so desired, provided your temperament could take that much excitement. 
I dipped back into my past and began to recall an old girlfriend of mine who for a while had believed that when people referred to line dancing, they were actually saying lion dancing. On one occasion, when she was invited to go to a country and western club and try it, she refused, claiming that it was too dangerous. It was difficult to work out how I'd not managed to make that relationship work. So here he says, It seemed to be a perfectly normal store which sold books, CDs, cards and t-shirts. It even had a sign up saying shoplifters will be prosecuted, which seemed particularly unchristian. Surely the sign should have read, shoplifters will be preached to, prayed for, and then forgiven. And here he's talking about some of the titles of the religious books he found. The Ways of God, He Chose the Nails, Building a Contagious Church, What God Does When Women Pray, The God Chasers, Bad Girls of the Bible, and What We Can Learn From Them, and of course, Really Bad Girls of the Bible. This was interesting too, um, he says, uh, Nashville is the buckle of the Bible belt. What do you mean? Ingram Publishing used to publish the Bibles for all around the world. When people think of this town, then they think of music, but Nashville is actually a city founded on healthcare, insurance, and Bible manufacturing. Music Row is relatively tiny in terms of the people it employs. This would just tickle me, especially because Wayne's World 2 is one of my favourite films. He says, A few years earlier, I'd been introduced to Paul McCartney after the opening night screening of Wayne's World 2 in London. I remember I'd struggled to turn it into a lively or memorable exchange. His fame had barred the normal conversational routes to me. I could hardly kick things off with, So what do you do? Neither could I pay him polite compliments. I enjoyed the Beatles very much. They were a good group. Well done. And this uh, continues here, it says, What actually happened was that Paul took the initiative, probably being quite au fait with such social situations, and we'd ended up having a short chat about the movie Spinal Tap until he made his excuses and moved politely along. The interesting point is that I remember every single detail of that meeting, whereas I would be extremely surprised if Paul McCartney had any recollection of it having taken place at all. I guess this is what happens when ordinary people meet the Queen. The monarch must encounter so many countless oiks like you and me that she is hardly likely to remember the conversation which had taken place, whereas the likelihood is that we would be able to recall its every last detail. God, that's fantastic. You met the Queen, people would say in response to our proud boasts. What did she say to you? She said that she was very happy to be in our town, and she said that it was a beautiful day and that she hoped that there would be many more like it this summer. Wow. I like to think that every now and then the Queen is tempted to abuse her position and to mess things up for us by being deliberately weird. God, that's fantastic! You met the Queen! What did she say to you? She said that she thought all wood should be painted green and that it ought to be illegal to suck on mint humbugs in built up areas. Uh, wow, how lovely. This is kind of my approach to songwriting here. The thinking seemed to be that if you wrote 50 songs, the law of averages meant that one of them had to be good. Certainly, in a world as competitive as this, it was highly unlikely that anything mediocre was going to make the grade, so you needed to put in the hours in order to come up with that special song. Then, of course, you needed that magic ingredient in the form of a healthy tranche of good fortune. Then he goes to Sedan, and he's travelling with Irvin Welsh as well. <laughs> and we talk about this drug called Larium, which is an anti-malarial drug. It's actually what I think that uh, student had taken when she jumped out of the aeroplane to her death, you know, six months, a year ago or whatever. Back in Blighty, the doctor had told me that mosquitoes in this part of the world pack something of a malarial punch, so I was going to take every precaution I could. I'd already gone through the trauma of deciding whether to take larium or not. According to government health sources, larium is the only drug which offers you decent protection against malaria in this part of the world. But unfortunately, it is also the drug which, when you announce that you are taking it, causes people to take a sharp intake of breath, shake their heads and list all the horrible side effects which it has induced in them, and all of their friends and loved ones. After much deliberation, I'd opted to take the bloody stuff, but thankfully, thus far, I'd suffered no ill effects. I'd taken the pills once a week and I'd followed all the instructions on the box. Keep away from children, it had said. Well, I'd certainly done that. Apart from brushing past one in a supermarket, I hadn't been near a child for weeks. However, there still remained the risk that I might fall victim to one of the possible side effects listed on the accompanying leaflet. The most common ones were sickness, dizziness, vertigo, loss of balance, headache, sleepiness, diarrhoea and stomach ache. Less common ones included unusual changes in mood or behaviour, feelings of worry or anxiety, depression, feelings of persecution, crying, aggression, restlessness, forgetfulness, agitation, confusing, panic and hallucinations. As if this wasn't enough, it went on to list the possibility of visual disturbances, ringing in the ears, coordination problems, shaking of the hands and fingers, changes to blood pressure or heart rate, palpitations, skin rash, itching, hair loss, muscle cramps, joint pains and loss of appetite. As far as I could see, they might as well have put a sign on the side of the box saying, Warning, the effects of this drug may be considerably worse than malaria. We have a little reference to Buddy Holly here, who famously died in a car, uh, plane crash. And uh, Tony himself is getting on this very rickety looking plane. It says, We hit the mud at what seemed like enormous speed and wobbled a little. At once I became aware of how important it was for the airstrip to have been properly maintained. 
Had the wheels of our aircraft hit a small rock, then we would have been tipped clean over and my musical career would have acquired at least one similarity to Buddy Holly's. And we have this bit, again, he's travelling with Irving Well, she says. They're treating us like visiting politicians, I moaned to a patient Laura, as we tucked into an unexpectedly wholesome meal back on the UNICEF compound. They seem to think that we're more important than we are. Can't you tell them that Irvin wrote a novel about heroin addiction and I hitchhiked round island with a fridge? And then he sees Sting as well and he wonders whether to have a conversation. He says, it wasn't to be. With every breath he took and with every step he made, he wasn't watching me. This bit also amused me here. Anyone who paid any attention in geography will remember that Holland is uncompromisingly flat, largely because the Dutch reclaimed a good proportion of it from the sea. This, of course, was a most civilised thing to do. When they wanted more land, instead of invading a neighbouring country, the Dutch simply tipped some mud into the ocean and created a bit more territory that way. If only Hitler, if only Hitler had adopted a similar policy, I muse. And we get this, which is something I've noticed with my, with my visits to uh, Amsterdam. So, um, I didn't know whether it was Flemish, Dutch or Martian. Like most non-Dutch speakers making a visit to Holland, I'd made little effort to browse through Dutch phrase books. What was the point when they all spoke such good English? I remember what my friend Ben had told me about this country. A decade previously, he'd come to Holland to work for a five-year stint and had been taken weekly... A decade previously, he'd come to Holland to work for a five-year stint and had taken weekly Dutch lessons. However, every time he started to speak the language to someone, they would hear him struggling and immediately say, You're English, right? No problem, I speak English. The annoying thing is that the Dutch speak English a good deal better than many Brits, albeit with a mildly irritating American twang to their accent. The problem is that they watch too much American television, when they should obviously be listening to BBC Radio 4. Like many non-fiction books, it's also got a section of photos as well, which are quite cool to look at. This, this amused me too, so he's in Amsterdam, he says, Suddenly I was hit by the strong whiff of marijuana emanating from a nearby coffee house. A pleasant, soothing smell, and ten times nicer than the odour created by cigarettes. It reminded me that it wasn't just prostitution which was on the receiving end of the liberal approach of Amsterdam's decision makers. In this city, you could buy your dope and smoke it just as easily as you could hire a hooker and... Well, you get my point. I watched as some customers of a coffee house, I wonder how much coffee they sell, emerge smiling and giggling, and I felt confident they weren't about to cause any trouble. In my opinion, marijuana should be handed out free to English football supporters when they travel overseas. Frankly, they need help in seeing the funny side. He said, this tickled me because Slough was near me. He says, with each new day comes new hope, unless you live in Slough. And he meets Simon Cowell as well, so we get this little paragraph here. Simon Cowell's appearance suggested that his mirror was well used. He looked affluent too, and I thought, slightly camp. His office, like Marx, trumpeted his success in the form of gold discs and awards. There was little to suggest, however, that in six months' time this man would become a household name in Britain. He would acquire that status as a result of becoming the nasty judge in the hit TV show Pop Idol. What I didn't know then, and I can only guess that this had been the reason for the twinkle in Mark's eye, is that he already had something of a reputation for straight talking. And so Tony says to him, If after today I go on to become a bit of a sex symbol, you'd be wrong. I'd be surprised and happy. Have you been wrong before? Of course I have. The first time I saw Gary Barlow and take that, I said to their manager, Ditch the fat one. And he's talking about um, going to interviews for roles, for acting roles. Then the call came. Tony Hawks, would you like to come through? God, it was like a visit to the doctors, except you were the one who was going to administer the medicine. Your audition piece. As you were led through, you had one last chance for an anxious cough before it was time to strut your stuff in front of two or three strangers who beamed enthusiastically in a vain attempt to deaden the awful pain of the whole experience. There is a cat here with me. Um, I'm just going to start by finishing off my Tony Hawk's review. So just one last thing I wanted to mention here, um, which is... Uh, Parkinson. He's talking about Parkinson. So um, it says here, Parkinson is a clever bloke. His law, Parkinson's law, was particularly relevant to me right now because it states that work expands so as to fill the time for its completion. In other words, if like me, you had two years in which to do something, it's unlikely that you'll work like a dog to complete it by the end of the first month. Not when there are other pressing matters which require attention, like attending parties, watching TV, or lounging in the sun whenever it happens to come out. You need the deadline to draw a little closer before you truly apply yourself. It's human nature. Or so Parkinson reckons. And who am I to disagree with him? I mean, he's met Muhammad Ali and Rod Hull and Emu. Then the relief of it all being over, followed by the dreadful realisation that you could have done it so much better. Then the wait. Then the phone call of rejection. Then the month waiting for another audition. Then the repetition of the same hideous process. Oh, the glamour of the actor's life. There's no wonder most of them are potty. So overall, I did really enjoy One Hit Wonderland. It was great to read it now with the quarantine going on as well, so I could feel as though I'm getting out and about and stuff. And just this kind of light travel humour with the plot to it as well, really sort of is my kind of thing. So I gave it a 4 out of 5 and would recommend. 
So there we have it. That's what I thought of One Hit Wonderland by Tony Hawks. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.